to whom it may concern, this message is of the utmost importance. Please do not disregard it. I don't know for sure what website you'll be seeing this on, whoever you are, probably something submission-based, hopefully one where it stays up. Regardless, it is imperative that you keep reading. I'll explain why soon, but before I do, some context is in order. My brother was a brilliant man, brilliantly talented, brilliantly clever. It was difficult growing up in his shadow. We were raised in the same nurturing, middle-upper-class environment with two loving parents that encouraged us at every turn, but it seemed there was nothing I could do that he wouldn't outshine me. He was no savant, you see. Julian held his own in any situation, whether that be an exam or a party with friends. Hardly ever was he not the smartest person in the room or the most popular. Needless to say, I was a jealous sibling. My main source of bother was academic performance. I'm not an idiot even in comparison to my brother, but I was an underachiever for a long period of my adolescence. I'm not sure what I'd attribute it to. Hanging around the wrong people, perhaps. Having my head in the clouds. Something like that. I've always been intelligent, but for a while, I really struggled to knuckle down and use that intellect. For so long, I heard the same tired expression, if you'd only apply yourself. I'm sure some of you reading this can relate. It wasn't until many years later that that sentiment really rang true. I never outright hated Julian, but I have to admit there was invariably a growing seed of resentment in my heart for him, especially as we got older and his natural aptitude really began to shine. We both had an interest in computer science from a young age, most likely inherited from our father, who worked for Microsoft before they went out of business. I still remember those nights as kids when he'd sit us down in front of his computer and show us all the little intricacies of the code he was working on. Any other children our age would be bored out of their skulls, but there we sat, attentive as ever, our developing minds fascinated by the job's seemingly endless possibilities. Julian's other main curiosity, which I did not share, was an affinity towards online horror fiction. Though he grew out of that kind of stuff in his late teens, he knew I had a chip on my shoulder, mostly. He was apathetic towards it. We were never estranged, but he wasn't going to let my discontent get in the way of his success. Though I don't blame him, I suppose that was always Julian's downfall. He was just too headstrong, too confident. When we became adults, we parted ways. He went on to study at Harvard while I ended up dropping out of some bang average local university you won't have heard of. Following that, things were a little rough. My parents were fairly disappointed. They didn't cut me off. Rather, interacting with them became a depressing chore as they waited for their son to get his life together. At family gatherings, I gritted my teeth at the stories Julian told, developing virtual reality hardware, cutting edge stuff, pushing the boundaries of the way we interact with technology, all while I was couch surfing, barely making ends meet as the guy at a shitty school in a town I hated. It only made the prospect of snapping out of whatever haze I was in feel more difficult. It all changed one day soon after I got my first apartment. Julian showed up out of the blue on a dewy morning with an armful of equipment and a huge, beaming smile on his face. I let him in, we talked, and he promised that what he was going to show me would completely blow my mind. I watched as he paced about my living room setting up all his gadgetry. As soon as everything was ready, he switched on my computer and handed me a thin, plastic headset with exposed wires. Two notes hung from either side of the thing, which fitted snugly over my temples. While I sat back on the sofa and stared at the monitor before me, he gave me one simple instruction, type something into Google, but I don't have a keyboard. You don't need one. According to Julian's wishes, I simply thought about the action and it happened. The word something came up in the search box and my jaw dropped open in shock. At first, I thought the obvious that my brother was purposefully fooling me with some kind of prank or gimmick. The repeated tests all came up with the same result, and it wasn't just searching I could do telepathically, but anything, literally anything I could think of, limited to the capabilities of the computer. Of course, I had total control. There was even a sort of projection in my mind's eye as it was happening, like the process was actually occurring inside my brain. It wasn't perfect, but it was nothing short of amazing. You're one of the first people to try it. He told me once I'd tested everything out. We're calling it NeuroWorks, or something to that effect. 
I don't think that feeling of astonishment ever truly left me. It was then that I realized my petty indignation, the dissatisfaction I felt after so many years of being outclassed meant nothing in the face of my brother's achievements and I would be doing the world a disservice by failing to assist him. Julian departed that night after some drinks and a few laughs and the next day I enrolled once again for a degree in computer science. Four years later, I passed with flying colors and Julian hired me to work for him at his company. There may have been a bit of nepotism involved, but that's neither here nor there. The next few years were dizzying. During the time in which I was getting educated, Julian had been working with a team of elite neuroscientists, specialists, that filled in the gaps in his knowledge, did all the things he couldn't. Immediately, I felt I was in way over my head, but as my learning advanced, I gradually got up to speed, and my mood improved quite rapidly. That feeling of pride, like I was finally doing something productive with my life, was nothing short of fantastic, especially in the face of so many wasted years. I was never quite on Julian's level, of course, but with enough time, I grew to be a valued contributor to the NeuroWorks project. Off the back of a long period of arduous work, the device fully came to fruition, culminating in an international commercial release. It was a global success, and we made a fortune. Once we'd fully optimized it, it ended up being surprisingly cheap to produce and implement. The result was its adoption in billions of households and businesses. As expected, it completely changed the way we live and work in the virtual world. Worldwide productivity and efficiency increased tenfold. Even now, I'm typing this message with those same two nodes attached at either side of my head, hands-free. As cliched as it sounds, at that point, it truly felt like we were living in the future. Honestly, I would have been happy to stop there. I could have moved somewhere green and sunny, spent the rest of my days doing TED Talks and sipping cocktails on the balcony of a villa, not giving a single damn, but not Julian. Like always, Julian had his eyes set on further horizons on the subsequent stretch of progress. No sooner than a few months after NeuroWorks was released did he come up with his next magnificent idea, consciousness splicing. That was how he described it on the day he first sat me down to try and explain. We were outside a cafe, some pretentious, gentrified establishment in the heart of London with a coffee each. The next stage of human learning, or maybe even existence, as a whole. Neural works. Compared to this, it's just a stepping stone. Alex, he told me, if we get this right, we won't just be able to use computers with our minds. We'll be able to think like them. Two, I struggled to wrap my head around the concept. How do you mean, exactly? I replied, take what makes us sentient. Our minds, our passion, our free will, everything a machine lacks. How can it be improved? How can it be bettered? What we lack naturally, we as a species, I mean, can be found in a computer. The processing power, the boundless memory, the objectivity, not to mention the ability to conjure up any kind of information on a whim. The entire collective library of human knowledge dating back thousands of years. But there are limitations. Computers can't truly think for themselves. Not yet, anyway. They require input, direction. If we can intersect the strengths of man and machine, cross the gap that separates us, he was stirring his drink all the while. Julian had a thing about that. He could never look at you directly when he was thinking, like the image of your baffled face would put him off somehow. Okay, but you're talking purely in theoretical terms, right? We're centuries off reaching that point. I mean, creating a neural link between a person and macOS is one thing. I think it's possible. A bee passed before he sighed, grabbed a napkin, and produced a pen from his pocket. I waited as he sketched out a crude, yet complicated diagram. I can't recall it exactly, it was something to do with the relationship between time, space, and information. Far more philosophical than scientific, I remember thinking, the internet is a powerful beast. Our means of controlling it, of accessing it, even with neural works, are subpar. We just need another breakthrough, and then that could open the door for who knows what else. Traversing through decades online going back and forth whenever we want. Easier said than done, but it could be possible. It could, I disagree, not in our lifetimes, anyway. And even if it is, it sounds dangerous, very dangerous. The number of things that could go wrong, the variables, it doesn't bear thinking about. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. 
let's learn to walk before we run, eh? He was quiet after that. The conversation stuck with me for the next couple of years. We were working mostly on maintaining neural works at that time, delivering a steady stream of updates and enhancements as society began to mold itself around its advent. There was some discussion as to when the next big leap forward would be, the next huge announcement from Julian's company, but he remained tight-lipped about anything regarding that. It was then that he started acting, weird. I saw him less, and less in what was supposed to be our spare time together, the cancelled reservations, and missed family events added up, but whenever I asked him about it, he just shrugged it off. I'm a workaholic, he would say. You know you all mean the world to me, but so does this job. I tried to comfort myself with that, but deep down, I think I knew he was hiding something. Something he thought would worry me. That was outside my area of expertise. I was going to confront him about it eventually. I just ended up waiting too long. One night, he rang me out of nowhere. I remember shooting straight up into a sitting position in a pitch black room. I think I'd been having a nightmare. The metallic surface of my phone was cold and smooth in my sweaty palm as I picked up the call and pressed it to my temple. Meet me at this address in half an hour and be quick. I spoke a word or two in return, but the call had already ended. There was a soft blip and some postcode I didn't recognize appeared at the top of the screen. Doing exactly as my brother asked, I got up, got changed, and made the 20 minute journey by car. The place was a rundown warehouse in one of the rougher areas of town, where property prices were at their cheapest. I parked up and stepped outside, shivering as I cursed myself for not having the foresight to bring a thicker jacket. It wasn't immediately obvious which building I was looking for until I saw a flash of light through a broken window in the distance. Cautiously, I approached it, glancing around to assure myself I wasn't walking into a trap, as stupid as that thought was. The main door being completely boarded up meant an obscure gap in the brickwork was my entry point. Dodging the tiny droplets of water trickling in from the broken ceiling, I rounded a corner. The main, spacious area of the warehouse had been kitted out as a kind of makeshift workshop, near identical to a setup from Neural Works. It was as if someone had carved out one of our labs and dumped it here beside walls of crumbling paint. My brow was furrowed as I stared from a distance at the scurrying scientists, who flicked me awkward looks as they went about tending to a central apparatus. I recognized a few of them, but they paid me little mind. I'm sure they knew I was coming. It took me a few moments to realize, but Julian was part of the almighty cluster of machinery in the middle of it all. His body was a biological cog in an otherwise artificial setup. He was on his back, head tilted slightly forwards, arms splayed in a T-pose like he was being crucified. I'll never get that image out of my head, him lying there, not having quite noticed me yet, sweat upon his brow. He was shirtless, too, wires running up and down his arms, and a mesh inserted atop his shaved head, which was next to a monitor. The wires came down in gangly clumps off the side of the bed he was on and fed into this gargantuan hunk of steel by his side. It was truly massive, topped with blinking lights, and seemingly missing its outer casing. If I didn't know better, I'd have assumed he'd been kidnapped and experimented on. He looked at me, directly upwards from his perspective, and said, You're late. Through a smile. I wasn't smiling. Julian, what the hell is all of this? I apologize for not telling you sooner. Truth be told, I didn't want you to worry, but this is too important for you not to see. I was at a loss for words. What we're going to do here, today, right now, will change the course of humanity, and you need to be here to witness it. So get ready, we're starting. He shouted that last sentence, and all the scientists in the room shuffled to what could only be described as their posts. I merely watched as they started a countdown sequence of sorts, dutifully coordinating the machine through a large control panel. They communicated with short, snappy gestures and mumbled technobabble that I could barely pay attention to. Instinctively, I stepped back until I was at an arbitrarily safe distance. Seconds later, my mouth turned dry, and a quiet ringing in my ears began to form. I chalked it up to nerves initially, but it soon became apparent there was some kind of static in the air. Palpable interference that manifested in a painful shock as my hand grazed the shiny edge of a work surface. It seemed to be emanating from the middle of the room, where Julian was. His eyes were closed now, tightly, 
He gave the impression of someone concentrating very intently on something. There was a hum, so low you almost felt it before you heard it, slowly increasing in pitch. I suddenly had a headache, and I'm almost certain my hair was standing up under the confines of my flat cap. Panic surfaced within me as I noticed the scientists arguing. I shouted a word of protest, only to realize my ears had popped and I had a faint ringing. Something was clearly and utterly wrong. Julian's deathly stillness as he honed his thoughts had ended and he was now thrashing around, foaming at the mouth, unable to break free of his confines. I ran back over to his side. Don't touch me. He managed to force out. I could barely hear him. But the crazed look in his eyes, dilated like a cat's, convinced me to leave him alone. Instead, I focused my attention on the scientists. What are you maniacs doing to him? I yelled, switch that thing off. Now, one of them came and pushed me away. His mouth was moving, but I couldn't make out the words. The noise of the machine was just too loud. There was a collective moment of fear. As the tone became ear splitting, no one could hear anyone anymore. Julian looked like he was being possessed. My attention was drawn to the monitor beside him before it had been inert, but it was currently displaying a fast moving, almost psychedelic kaleidoscope of uniform shapes and colors. If you've ever seen what a computer looks like when you remove its RAM while it's running, it was like that, but even more erratic and animated. I was practically hypnotized by it, and as I gazed further and further into its depths, an awful image began to emerge. It was Julian. I swear to God, I know it sounds crazy, but Julian's face materialized in the form of this nightmarish coalescence of text and code. His mouth was open and his eyes were bulging out of his skull. I turned to my brother to see him doing the exact same expression there on the table, unable to breathe. It made me feel sick to my stomach. Suddenly, the machine shut down, taking the monitor's display and oppressive interference with it. Julian's eyes glazed over, his face went pale as a sheet, and he slumped down onto his back, letting out a huge exhale. It was when he didn't take another breath that two white-coated men went to check his pulse. A single head shake between them confirmed what I feared. Gone. I think I was in shock the whole rest of the night, because I didn't speak a word to anyone until the morning. They sent me home in a taxi, and promised to take care of what had happened. I burst into furious, bitter tears. As soon as I put the keys in the door, I was so, so angry at being kept in the dark and lied to for so long, with this having been the culmination. Little did I know that was just the beginning. Julian's team called me in to work the next day for a private meeting. To maintain the company's work and appearance, they were going to sweep the whole thing under the rug. Figures, I remember thinking. My first urge, naturally, was to fight this burial to expose them and bring about some sense of justice, but I was talked down from it. You might call me cowardly for that, but put yourself in my shoes for a minute. I had no real evidence at hand, and it soon became apparent that the scientists were only operating under my brother's command. Everything had been planned out in advance, even the system that was being followed now, for what would happen if a fatal accident occurred. Telling the world the true events of that night would have been a losing battle already. They began cleaning up their mess, demolishing the warehouse lab, scrubbing all evidence from the archives, etc. It was a tough call, but I felt compelled to adhere to my brother's wishes and keep moving forward with narrow works. You can judge me for that if you want, but I don't care. I forgave them all over time. It wasn't even really their fault Julian had died that night. There had been a freak malfunction with the equipment, leading to them being unable to turn it off. I won't go too in-depth. There's a lot about it that I still don't understand to this day. Anyway, once the dust had settled, we put the incident behind us and gave up the whole cutting edge angle for a while. We started pursuing safer technological ventures like media creation, but that was when something strange began happening. You see, Julian's cause of death seemed obvious initially, most likely a heart attack or stress-related aneurysm, but the autopsy revealed something startling. There was little to no internal damage anywhere in his body, no burst blood vessels or spasmed arteries. Rather, all the electrical signals in his body had simply vanished simultaneously, deactivating his brain. It was as if he had literally been switched off. None of this ever got out. Of course, Neuroworks, now one of the most valuable, powerful companies of all time, made sure of that. 
Julian's death was publicly credited as a stroke due to undetected high cholesterol levels, but it's certainly interesting considering what came after. Over the next few weeks, we had virus troubles. A malicious software was making its way through our computer system. There was a bit of a panic to begin with. An internal investigation revealed we had far too much unsecured data that anyone working for a market competitor would be happy to steal and sell to the highest bidder. But the more we found out about it, the more curious we became. The strange thing about it was only partly what it did. Corruption and deletion are pretty bog standard as far as viruses go, but its effects were largely patternless, like it was picking items at complete random. But it was also when it was doing it. After some research, we found that people had been complaining about this mystery malware they designated as Worst R due to the word apparently repeating itself over and over again in damaged code and text boxes since the beginning of the internet. Despite this, its existence had never been formally documented anywhere, which is extremely bizarre. Whatever Worst R is, it's completely transcendent of time. We think we know what's going on, though. We had our ideas to begin with, and there were plenty of skeptics amongst us, but a recent event has all but verified it. A couple of months ago, I found a TXT file on my computer that wasn't there the day before, entitled Worst Target. It was an enormous mass of code that took weeks to fully analyze. Delving into the nitty gritty of the whole thing would take forever, but from what we've been able to glean from it, and I promise I'm being serious, when I say this, it's a formula for communicating virtually with the past, which brings us to today. Well, our today, we're sending this message from the year 2050 to what we've calculated to be the mid-2010s. Myself and Julian should only be little children. Don't worry, this isn't some Terminator-style mission to erase or alter a former timeline. We just need you to tell us something. The code wasn't the only thing in the TXD file. There was a message, a message we can't understand. It's been cobbled together on an old, outdated editor that isn't compatible with the modern neural work setup anymore. Believe me, we've tried everything, but not even old computers will display it. We think our failure to view it is the whole reason we're even able to talk to you now. In your time, it should still be legible. You may need to do something with it. View it through a source editor, perhaps, but it won't be hard to decipher. You should be able to communicate with us, too. Hopefully, we've tested this with random forums, dozens of messages we made that were supposedly sent in 2012, and had people respond to them in that same year. We're well aware of the danger associated with this, but at the same time, it's the only chance we've got. I'm going to wrap this up by apologizing. I'm sorry that I haven't been more specific throughout this message. There's a lot I've glossed over in the pursuit of keeping things relatively short. Maybe this is just a lost cause. The technology we're using is still extremely unrefined, so there's a chance this might not even get out there. But it's been 10 years since Julian died, and I'd give anything to be able to see my brother again. If this works, if we're able to somehow establish contact, then we may even be able to reverse the process to find him a human host. So, please, for the love of God, please, what does it say? Where is Julian? 